I am pleased to announce our next speaker. His name is Daniel Sellers. Daniel is interested in the normal nerd things, banjo, mechanical keyboards, voting probabilities, board games, racing road bikes, home renovation, CNC machines, organizational design, tinkering with cars, and reading. I wonder if he sleeps. He has been known to talk too much and get overly excited about things like early American history, new programming languages, management philosophy, and ethics. He has worked places including NASA and in structure and is currently the VP of engineering at Osmosis. Please with you, uh, with me, join, sorry, <laughs> those words came out in all the wrong order. Please join me in welcoming Daniel Sellers. Can you guys hear me? Okay, that's better. All right, thank you for welcoming me. Um, it's my turn to welcome you. Uh, thank you for taking a half hour of your time to come and listen to me ramble. Um, thank you for being here, especially for people who are new to the industry. Thank you for joining us. And for those of you who look around your stand-ups every day and don't see a lot of people who look like you or act like you, thank you for being here. Um, we, we need you as an industry, and we value you being here. <laughs> so um, this sort of forlorn-looking guy is uh, Heraclitus. Heraclitus was a Greek philosopher, and he said such things as, the only constant in life is change. Um, he called this flow. It was part of his philosophy. Um, and... To be honest, like looking back at this picture, he looks about as excited about the idea that change is part of life as you and I do. Uh, not particularly excited that nothing's going to stay the same. Um, but let's, let's jump forward from 585 BC to 1985. Um, 1985 is a pretty good year. Um, Aha, Take On Me becomes the... Let's see if this will work the number 10 song on the Billboard Top 100 at the end of 1985. Um, it's beat out by Madonna's Like a Virgin and some song by George Michael that I can't remember. But more importantly, 1985 is when Peter Naur writes a paper called Programming is Theory Building. This is Peter Naur. He's a Danish astronomer turned uh, computer scientist. He was a winner of the Turing Award um, and really, really uh, developed some very, very important things for computer science. Um, and in this paper, where he outlines how, to him, programming is actually the building of theories rather than the manufacturing of a good, um, one of the things he says is this. He says, what characterizes intellectual activity is the person's building and having a theory, where theory is understood as the knowledge a person must have in order not only to do certain things, so in order not only to build something, but also to explain them, to argue about them, and so forth, a person who has a theory is ready to engage in such activities while building the theory the person is trying to get it. So uh, that last sentence is a little confusing, but what he's saying is when you have a theory for how things work, you should be able to explain it, you should be able to argue about it and discuss about it, um, and that when you're developing the theory, you're in the process of acquiring the knowledge necessary to do that. Um, this is a very important idea because it tells us this, that theories take time to develop and understand, and if we accept that programming is the process by which we create theories to encapsulate user behavior or the behavior of a system, it's going to take us time. Um, as an example of this, you may know Albert Einstein here from uh, such you know, hits as general and special relativity um, and E equals MC squared. But something that we don't often think about is that while special relativity was fully formulated and he wrote about it in 1905, um, he took off a couple of years and from 1907 to 1915, he was working on general relativity, and it took him eight years, nine years, to go from special relativity, which is more uh, focused in its application, to general relativity, uh, which gives it the, the broad application that we know today. So, eight years. 
So the next time you're uh, estimating a task and you're not sure how long it's going to take, don't feel bad. Einstein also had no idea how long it was going to take. Another thing that we can kind of pull from relativity is this idea that two people of observing the same thing are likely to arrive at different understandings of what is happening. Um, depending on, if you remember relativity, depending on your position, your fixed position in the universe, um, what you observe is going to be slightly different than someone in another fixed position in space. Um, because your movements are different, and the way things are moving in relation to you is different. So let's take those and let's think about them in terms of programming. <laughs> so programs, if we accept that they're theories, which I think we should, um, and if we accept that depending on where you're standing in the universe, you're going to understand something differently than a person standing in another position, then programs in their theories are going to not only change over time, thanks to Heraclitus, um, but they'll also be hard to understand. Because depending on when you start interacting with that program, how developed it is, how immature it is, um, how much documentation there is around it, your understanding of the theory that makes up that program is going to be different than the person who originally wrote it. Um, there's a, a strong argument to make that this is often the source of bugs, that because we don't understand um, what the previous developers really intended for the code to do, um, we're going to misinterpret that. And because we misinterpret it, we're going to make changes that aren't in line with the original theory that was there. Sometimes that's not a big deal. Um, but sometimes this is how small bugs can turn into large refactors of core concepts, or how small features can grow into uh, epic development tasks that take months, because that theory didn't accommodate the, this new piece that we're trying to add to it, this new state of the world. I'm sure you're all thinking this right now, which is fine. It's understandable, even. The title of the talk says architecture. You know, when are we going to get to the software architecture? It's coming. Uh, but before we get there, I want to make really clear that from here out, nothing that I say is prescriptive. Um, these are principles that you can use to help refine your architecture and to help make architectural decisions. But those principles are going to have different application in your team and in your company than they will in my team or my company. Um, this is like maybe one of the things that I've learned the hard way the most times in my career in software is that there is generally not a right way to do something in software. Um, and that may sound like heresy, but in my years in the industry, that is what I've learned. Um, there is no one best language. There is no one best front-end framework. There is no one best API style. Um, all of them have a place. All of them have a time when they're the appropriate choice. So my goal today is not to tell you how to go out and re-architect your entire system so that it's right and perfect and better. Um, I wish that I could do that, but I can't. My goal today is to give you three principles that I've used um, and that I've changed and developed over the years that help me make architectural decisions in the hopes that you can apply them to yourself and your problems um, and use them to make better architectural decisions that are appropriate for your team and your, your stack. Um, I have in my notes here that I should let all of you know, if you're ever working with someone and they tell you that there is a right way, and they insist that there is a right way, you should probably run away. Um, because the correct answer for anyone who's been in the industry for a while is, it depends. Um, and yeah, I know I just spoke in an absolute, but I feel confident in that particular absolute. All right, so let's go. Let's talk about the principles. <laughs> OK, this is the first principle. Move slow to go fast. Um, I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine. This is a platypus. Um, platypuses are really weird. Uh, they, have, they lay eggs, but they're a mammal. They have these like poison talons on their back feet. They're very strange creatures. They have a duck bill, um, and they're a mammal. It doesn't make a lot of sense, to be honest. Um, and the reason we have a platypus here is because we need to ask ourselves, 
we're going slow, we're making slow changes, um, if we're evolving things over time, does evolution make mistakes? Um, is the platypus an evolutionary mistake? No. It's still alive. It hasn't died. Uh, it's not extinct. It continues to exist in its environment. Thus, it's not a mistake. It looks really weird and awkward, but it's not a mistake. And so the thing we want to do is aim for gradual evolution. Um, evolution in nature is interesting when it comes to this because evolution doesn't suffer from sunk costs fallacy. All of us do. Um, but evolution is totally fine with having a branch of evolution terminate and come to an end. It does not care at all. We do because we're humans and we don't believe, we, we like to believe that the things we've invested time in are important. And we don't like to believe that we would spend a lot of time making the wrong choices, heading down a dead end path. Um, and so when we are writing our software, we need to A, be conscious of that. There's probably a time where you're gonna need to throw away some code you wrote um, because you've, you may find that you have gone down the wrong path. And two, our aim should be to make small steps because a small step is much easier to back out of than a huge leap. Um, there's often a temptation for software developers, I suffer from it, that like we see something that's bad, bad, and we want to fix it, and we want to fix the whole thing. Um, and that almost always results in us having not four types of buttons now, but five. Um, and so we want to make small, gradual steps. This is Wyatt Earp. Um, you may or may not know him. Usually people use pictures of him that are older, uh, but this is a nice one. He's younger, he's 21 here. He's credited with saying this, fast is fine, but accuracy is final. You must learn to be slow in a hurry. Um, so we want to go slow to go fast. Um, we can talk about car racing, all sorts of other things, but this is a principle that holds for a lot of things. So make small, gradual changes. Um, take time to think about them before you leap into them. One way we do this uh, where I work is for large structural changes or new services that we're going to create. We write requests for comment. Um, and the purpose of a request for comment is not to get consensus, it's to validate your thinking. It's to make sure that you've accounted for um, things that you might not necessarily know. So you're getting as many opinions as you can, not to achieve consensus, but to achieve breadth of understanding. Um, so that's one of the principles there. Uh, this, is, this is one of my favorites. Is it simple? This is also the most uh, fraught and probably the most confusing of these principles. So is it simple? I forgot to put a picture of Rich Hickey in here. Rich Hickey has an excellent talk called Simple Made Easy. Um, if you haven't watched it, I encourage you to Google it and watch it. Um, he's a, a phenomenal speaker. He's the, the father of Clojure, um, which is a really fun functional programming language on the JVM. Um, but in talking about the differences between simple and easy, he says this. He says, we can only hope to make reliable those things we understand. And there is usually a trade-off. When evolving a system, making it more extensible and dynamic, it may become harder to understand and decide if it is correct. He goes on to say, people focus too much on the construct, on how easily they can write something or how easily it is to replace one developer with another. Considering just the familiarity of the tools used, not the simplicity or complexity of the code the new developer needs to deal with. So um, just to like simplify this down, easy things are the things you reach for that seem fast at the beginning. Um, it might be a tool that spits out a whole new service for you. It might be a framework. Um, but it's whatever you think of that's the first thing you grab and the main promise of it is going faster. Easy things are not that, because those things are often complicated and backing out of those choices is often very difficult. Easy things are small things that are easy to reason about. So the aim in making these architectural decisions with this principle is to think about 
is what we're building, the code I'm writing, is it simple? Not necessarily is it easy for me to write it or easy for me to reason about it, but is it simple? Will someone else be able to understand this code clearly? And is it contained in a way that makes it easy to reason about? Um, when I say reason about, I'm not talking about any like formal reasoning. Um, I'm talking about, think about the boundaries of it. Um, is it easy to hold in your head? Can you hold it all in, in your brain at one time, or do you need to sort of segment out pieces of it? Um, and there are a lot of different techniques that you can use to achieve that. OK, our third principle. <clears throat> this is one that I've come to later in my career than the other two. And it is, which choice opens up more future options? Um, a few years ago, we, there was a, a small gathering of senior engineers here in the valley. Um, and we all sat down around a table and with a bunch of pizzas on it. And we, we were kind of given the table topic to discuss as a really like loose panel. It was really more like a whole bunch of people sitting around arguing about this question. But it was, how do you plan for the next rewrite, essentially? Like, how do you plan for the future and for flexibility? And it was a really, really interesting discussion. Um, and one of the, the things that obviously we had to answer was, you know, does there have to be a next rewrite? Um, there does. If you are lucky enough that the company you work for continues on into the future, there's going to be another rewrite. Like, spoiler alert, hate to break it to you. Uh, the code that you're writing today in five years is going to be insufficient for the needs of that company, unless that company isn't growing. If that company's not growing, then the chances of it being around in five years and you still working there is relatively low. Um, the needs of the company, the needs of the business, they are going to evolve. You're going to have to rewrite it. Um, frameworks are going to come and go. React is here now. Will it be here in 10 years? Angular is here now. Will it be here in 10 years? Probably not. We'll be using something else. We may not even be programming to browsers at that point. And it's important to understand this because understanding this drives home the need to keep your options open. Um, so one simple way to think about this in just in your front end code is does your React code, does you, do your, your React classes, do they have business logic in them? And if so, why? There's no reason for it to be there. It could be housed outside in a plain JavaScript function, imported in and, and worked on. And that's a small change that you can make that opens up a lot of options. Because guess where else you could run that business logic? You could run it on the server. You could run it in Angular. You could run it in Vue. Um, you could run it essentially in any other framework. Because the business logic itself generally doesn't actually care about um, the display part. And so that's a very hard thing, though, right? Like, all of our habits is to like, create a new class and like, start working. And like, there's the business logic. And when the state is this, we want to show this result. Well, maybe that's not the most future-friendly way to do that. Um, let's see if it comes back. So, Start to think about what are the things you can do to prepare for that inevitable rewrite. Because it is inevitable, and it is coming. Um, and the longer you wait to figure it out, the harder it's going to be to prep for it. So there's a tension here, obviously, between um, moving quickly and thinking things through, between preparing for the rewrite and getting code out the door that allows your company to continue so that you can have that rewrite. Like in a weird way, if you think about it, that rewrite is your bonus for helping the company succeed, um, which is a weird way to think about it, because you may not actually enjoy that rewrite that much. But tension's a good thing. Um, tension between principles and between goals is really, really important. Um, I don't know how many of you 
are familiar with sailing or who, how many of you have done some sailing, um, but sailing only works by tension between the sails, the direction of the wind, and the keel on the ship. Because contrary to what you might think, the fastest way you can possibly go in a sailing vessel is not downwind. It's actually at an angle into the wind. It's much faster. And the reason is because of that tension that's created between the water, the ship, and the wind. That allows you to create force that moves you faster. Um, and so, yes, there's tension in these principles, and there's tension in what you need to accomplish. But that tension is an important tool to move you forward. Because we'd all love to just like sit around and debate architecture all day long. But we all have deadlines. And that means we have finite time to do those things, which pushes us to make decisions within constraints. So let's talk a little bit about the application of this. Because um, this has all been like hand wavy and theory and some nice like anecdotes. Um, so I've been working very closely with my data team over the last couple of months. And one of the things that we started doing last year was building out a data pipeline. Um, our data needs are relatively low. Um, we're talking a few million events a day, um, a few terabytes of data in the warehouse. Nothing Google scale or Facebook scale. Um, but when we originally sat down and started designing that system, we wound up with this. Um, so we've got, if you look carefully, we have some uh, Cloud Pub Subs. It's hosted in GCP. So we're using the native uh, Google Cloud Pub Sub. Those were firing off a cloud function that we call the data ingester. Its job is to validate the inbound events, make sure that we know what they are, make sure they're structured properly, that we can take action on them, and then to write them out to some base tables. Um, if they fail validation, put them in a failed events table so that we can go back and check and see what's up with those events later on, and write them into a couple of other base tables that will then be processed by DBT, which is a, a data modeling tool. Um, which will then put them in a whole bunch of smaller, more granular, final tables in BigQuery that we can use to, to create charts and graphs and uh, drive business decisions. So we made the decision to architect it this way because we knew that, uh, one, we don't have a lot of humans in our organization to manage a lot of servers. Um, and this let us rely on a whole bunch of managed services that Google provides. So we didn't have to worry about the ops side as much. Um, and it also gave us a lot of flexibility. Um, and we could write it in JavaScript, which was great. Most of our team works in JavaScript. Most of them are very familiar with it. Um, so if we needed to pull engineering resources over to the data team, easy, because they would know the language that we were working in. And we created this. We shipped it out into the world. And it sat there and did its thing. And we didn't really think about it a whole bunch. Um, and then. About two months ago, um, our Google credits started to run out. For those of you in startups who have dealt with Google billing, you know that this can be terrifying. Um, all of a sudden, we had a really big bill coming in the not too distant future. And it was directly related to the way we were building our data models. Um, it had to do with how DBT was writing to BigQuery. So we sat down and we thought about okay, how do we? fix this problem. We need the data there. We need it often, because it drives our user analytics. Um, and how do we cut our costs dramatically? So uh, this is maybe a little more confusing. There's more going on here. But what we realized is that we'd set ourselves up really, really well, because we'd thought about this exact situation as we were designing the pipeline back last fall. And we'd said, OK, when that happens, how are we going to solve it? What are our likely choices there? Um, so what we wound up doing is spinning up another uh, Cloud Pub Sub topic, having the data ingester write all of the validated events to that Pub Sub, um, which is great. So now we have essentially an event bus that's getting all the validated events um, that we can then process without having to worry about validation. 
And from there, we spun up another cloud function that subscribed to that, that stream of events. And its job was to do some transforms and write them to those final tables. So now we got our final data models directly, nearly instantaneously. I'll put like some asterisks after that. It's like half a second of network and processing time. Um, but it works. And it's much quicker than the hourly builds we were doing before. So, and then, like, horror of horrors, we did not write this part in JavaScript. Um, we'll come back to that. But it, it allowed us to very easily splice into our existing framework without having to make dramatic changes anywhere. And we now have, looking to the future, we have these options to expand this. Right now, we're doing automated transforms for a handful of tables. Um, in the event that we need real-time data in other areas, it's very easy for us to write additional transforms, add them to this transform function, or to add additional transform functions, um, because that event bus gives us a lot of flexibility. So it sort of shows off all of those decisions. Uh, the simplicity, because each of these things is very, very constrained. It's not hard to reason about. Um, the transform functions are simple and clear because all they do is receive data from the message, pull out pieces of it that are important, augment it in certain cases, and write it to a database table. It's really simple code. Um, they don't have to validate because of those choices we made early on. So stats, uh, it took us eight days to write from when we created the repo to when we finished it with like one and a half people working on it. Um, 15 days from the time that we started it to when it was rolled out to our full user base in production and was the system of record for user analytics. Um, we've had no, no bugs, no issues with it since we launched it. And it's processing three to four million messages per day in near real time. And it just sits there and chugs along. And it costs a tenth, less than a tenth of what we were doing before and gives us up to the minute analytics as opposed to hourly analytics. And it was written in Python. And so this is another part that's really important. Why Python? Well, because if you go out and look at all of the main BI tools that are out there and the big data pipelines, all of them can accept Python functions for data transformation. This means that if we ever migrate to a fully fledged BI tool, all we have to do is copy and paste the code from those cloud functions into that system, maybe make a few shifts, and we'll be good to go. Um, so choosing Python was actually part of looking to the future and opening up our options. We can continue to run it as a cloud function forever, but we now also have the option to move it into a more mature BI tool if that's the, the route that we end up going in the future. So to sum things up, move slow to go fast. Take time to think about it before you jump into it. Is it simple? Are you going to be able to reason about that thing in isolation? Or is it going to get entangled in everything else? Which choices open up more future options? Look to the future. You know what you want that architecture to look like eventually. What is the, the small baby step you can take now that gets you closer to that? Because um, that's going to be a better choice. I'm Daniel Sellers. Thank you for coming. Uh, my contact information is up there. Um, I'll be out in the hall so if you want to ask questions later on. But I appreciate you all being here. Thanks.